now begin the program. May I request uh, our distinguished guest speaker, Ambassador Talvi Zamad, our chairperson for the event, Ambassador Gautam Bambawali, and participant in today's discussion, Professor Alwait Ning Jautham, to please come to the stage. Mitraho, Namaskar, and welcome to this book release and discussion program on Ambassador Talmi Zamad's latest book, West Asia at War, Repression, Resistance, and Great Power Games at the Pune International Center. I am Abhay Vaitya, Director of PIC. Let me begin by welcoming our distinguished guest for today's program. The chair for today's event, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale, former Indian Ambassador to China, Bhutan and Pakistan and trustee PIC, our distinguished guest speaker, Ambassador Talmi Zamad, Professor Alwai Nang Jantau, Assistant Professor, Symbiosis School of International Studies, Pune International Center's Vice President, Dr. Vijay Kelkar, who is here with us, members of PIC, trustees and ladies and gentlemen. We are indeed fortunate and honored to have with us as distinguished a speaker as Ambassador Talmi Samad, undoubtedly India's foremost expert on West Asia. He had two stints as India's ambassador to Saudi Arabia, <coughs> was ambassador to Oman and the UAE, held diplomatic posts in Kuwait, Iraq and Yemen, and was the head <coughs> of the Gulf and Hajj Division in the Ministry of External Affairs. His latest book of 500 pages has 75 pages of notes and references. He has dedicated this book to the eminent Arab scholar Edward Said, Israeli scholar Shlomo Sand, and to his mentor and diplomat turned politician Mani Shankar Ayer. Mr. Ayer has called this book encyclopedic in the vastness of its ambit and the micro-focus on key historical, political, religious and economic developments in each of the nations of East Asia. The chair for today's event, Ambassador Gautam Babawale, is a former Indian ambassador to China and Bhutan and former High Commissioner to Pakistan. Ambassador Babawale was stationed in Washington, D.C during the signing of the Indo-US nuclear deal of 2007, which transformed ties between the two countries. He is a trustee of Pune International Center and one of the co-authors of PIC's book, Rising to the China Challenge, Winning Through Strategic Patience and Economic Growth. Professor Alwai Ning Thao Jam is an assistant professor at the Symbiosis School of International Studies. He earned his PhD from the Center for West Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, for his doctoral thesis on Israel's arms export and the US factor. He has also served as consultant at the Strategic Affairs Wing of the National Security Council Secretariat in the Prime Minister's Office, New Delhi. To say that West Asia has a very significant bearing on world politics would indeed be an understatement. As far as we are concerned, India has had very deep ties with West Asia since ancient times. The invention of zero, for example, happened in India and was taken to the West by Arab scholars. India's ties with West Asia continue to be strong and today's discussion is very timely and topical. This program will have a short Q&A segment and we will pass around the microphone for your questions. Before we move into the discussion, I would like to say a few words about Pune International Center, which is a multifaceted policy research think tank now in its 11th year. 
TIC's logo in purple and gold, right up there, represents churning, a churning of thoughts and ideas. In the words of TIC's president, Dr. Raghunath Marshalkar, Pune International Center is a Vichar Manthan Kendra. It is an independent, multifaceted think tank which seeks to foster the values enshrined in the constitution. TIC's goals are to provide a forum for liberal thought, an environment for free and fair public debates, and provide a platform to promote the arts and culture. PIC works closely with the younger generation to promote innovative, inclusive, and progressive thinking in all fields of public life. This think tank is funded by its 450 plus members, most of them Punekars. This center works in the areas of national security, energy, environment, and climate change, social innovation, science, technology, innovation, and national growth, and economic reforms and urbanization. From time to time, PIC interacts closely with the Maharashtra government, the central government, and notably the ministries of defense and external affairs, and Niti Aayog. In fact, Ambassador Pambawale is convener of the annual Asia Economic Dialogue, the international conference held by the PIC in partnership with the External Affairs Ministry. With this, we will now release the book and I would like to invite Ambassador Talmi Zamat, Ambassador Gautam Pambawale and Professor Alwai to please do the office. Thank you. I now request the chairperson for today's event, Ambassador Gautam Bambaude, to kindly deliver his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me. Good. Uh, let me first of all start by thanking all of you for coming out because um, Pune International Center is just slowly beginning to have some kind of physical events. Today's event is actually what Abhay describes as fidgetal, which means it's partially physical with a few people inside the hall and also digital with a large audience uh, over Facebook and uh, it's being live streamed to them today. So thank you for coming here and thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, let me start by saying that I have known uh, Ambassador Talmi Zamad for several years and I knew that anything he wrote, a book of this kind, would be of the highest order and of the best magnitude. And when I went through this book over the last few days, and I must confess I have not read every <coughs> word, uh, but I have speed read the book and, and got the main points, uh, it is absolutely magnificent. It uh, looks at West Asia, actually it looks at what he would describe in the book as West Asia and North Africa. So what we in the Ministry of External Affairs of India used to call as WANA, W-A-N-A, -A, West Asia and North Africa. He uses the term West Asia as a sort of, uh, uh, you know, shorter, ter shorter terminology to describe this area, this geography. Uh, but he has taken a sweep of over 200 and odd years uh, to, uh, you know, to bring us up to date to the present and to explain how uh, West Asia is uh, constantly uh, at war or is always there's repression, resistance and great power gains in that part of the world. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I really don't know much about that part of the world and having never served there. I traveled there as a diplomat for certain uh, meetings and events, but Ambassador Talmi Zamad has spent large amounts of time not only as ambassador twice over to Saudi Arabia, but also in the United Arab Emirates and also as a junior diplomat in that part of the world. So he's really, as I described him, an expert of this uh, particular geography. 
And going through the book, reading the book was absolutely stunning for me because I could see that he had taken a long sweep of history to explain what is happening in that geography today. Um, I am not going to talk too much about that. I am just going to mention one or two things about India and West Asia. We all know that that part of the world is very important to India because a lot of our imported oil comes from that geography. We know that uh, there are about 8 million Indians who work in, in West Asia and North Africa and send back uh, remittances every year of anywhere from 30 to 40 billion US dollars, billion with a B. So these are very significant amounts of people, these are very significant amounts of uh, capital transfers which take place every year and therefore uh, it's absolutely essential for India as a country uh, and, and it's a very integral part of that, uh, of the world, the way we look at it. Recently, of course, we have had yet another the reminder of how important West Asia is to us when some of the smaller West Asian countries, Qatar and, and uh, Kuwait, uh, took up the issue of two spokespersons for the current ruling party talking about uh, the profit and we have seen how that has had a fallout not only on Indian foreign policy but also on domestic uh, uh, affairs. But uh, let me not come between you and Ambassador uh, Talmiz Ahmad. Uh, let me also just say that uh, on the, if you look at the big picture, I think over the last 20 odd years, including during his ambassadorships in those uh, countries, UAE and Saudi Arabia, India has steered the course with West Asia reasonably well. Today, we are fairly close to both Saudi Arabia as well as the United Arab Emirates. And one example of how this relationship has developed is the fact that a contingent of the UAE army marched down Rajpath on 26 January a few years ago. So that's how it has transformed and that's how we have got closer to uh, the countries, not only in the Gulf, but also in North Africa. And uh, uh, to that extent, we have, uh, you know, we have made Pakistan irrelevant to our bilateral relationship with those countries. And in fact, if you look at the pure economics of it, India is a much more important economic entity uh, than our Western neighbor. But I'm going to stop there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to request Ambassador Talmi Zahnath to speak. Uh, I want him to speak for a longer period of time. I want him to give us his, uh, you know, his uh, take on why he wrote the book, what are the main aspects of the book. And I, I also request you, Ambassador Ahmad, to maybe perhaps quote certain segments of the book which are germane to this conversation. So I uh, now request Ambassador Talmi Zaman to take the floor and I'll hand the microphone to him. He'd like to speak from there, maybe that's better. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely flattered that so many of you could find time to be here. I'm very, very grateful to you. This city is very special to me. I came here in 1967 at the age of 14 and I went to school, college and, and university here. I appeared for the IAS exam while I was doing my master's degree and I have nurtured in me a very deep affection for this city and indeed for this state. Many people ask me to which place I belong and I say that I think of myself as a Maharashtra. I, I lived in Bombay before coming to Pune and I think of myself as a Maharashtra. I speak extremely poor Marathi but I am a very enthusiastic speaker and I am constantly reprimanded for extremely poor grammar. But the enthusiasm overwhelms my capacity. This book is a product of the pandemic, on one hand, so last one and a half years, and at the same time it is a product of an involvement with this region over more than three decades, nearly four decades. I was the first Muslim officer in the Indian Foreign Service in 1974 
after a 10 year gap. And without any application of the mind, the ministry gave me Arabic as my language. Nobody asked me anything, they said you are getting Arabic. Because, because we have to handle, Muslim officers have to handle Hajj. And to go to Makkah and Medina, you have to be a Muslim. So there was a long term investment in me by the ministry by giving me Arabic. And that is how I landed up initially in Kuwait. As part of our training, we have to pass the Arabic exam. Nobody found out whether there was any teaching facility there. There wasn't. And I looked at a long career of remaining a third secretary in the foreign service because I would not be able to either learn the exam, I would not be able to learn Arabic and pass the exam. I was deployed in the consular section and my entire effort was to support the mission's efforts in terms of our, of our, uh, I mean, in terms of our outreach to the community. As a result of the oil revenues that had flooded this region, the number of Indians had gone up. So, from about 1,500, the number had gone to 5,000, 7,000, 8,000, 10,000. And it was beyond the capacity of our embassy to take care of this burgeoning numbers. And since in those days we could not create posts and we could not transfer posts between missions, I was sent as an additional hand in the ministry. Uh, I mean, uh, I was then sent as an additional hand in the embassy. And that is what I did. And we used to sit in the consular section and a very large number of maid servants would come to us and we would interview them to find out if they were being treated well. I had not yet come to that. I then hired a private tutor who taught me Arabic. The book prescribed by the government of India for Arabic had been published in 1875 or 1880. It had gone through several editions after that and finally it landed with me. It was possibly the first standard or second standard basic text which had been studied by young Arabs about a century earlier. And that is the Arabic we were supposed to read. It was hardcore classical Arabic. The tutor that I had said, I am not going to touch this book. It belongs to another century. Even my grandfather doesn't speak like this. That is my textbook. So you can imagine it was a very long and strenuous and stressful period to pass this exam. I had another experience. To pass the exam after I had learned something, I had to prepare for the written exam. So in those days, there used to be a compulsory essay question. And the previous several years had shown a pattern which said, my family, my brother, my classroom, my school. And I prepared those essays. The actual paper when it arrived said, the first essay topic, democracy and socialism. <laughs> I could not even read the title, much less write about it. I didn't even know enough in, in English, much less write it in Arabic. The other topics were similarly esoteric, India's democratic experience, fundamental rights in India, etc. There was one topic that saved me, Indian cinema. <laughs> I knew that. And my essay read as follows. Indian cinema very good. Indian cinema very big. Indian cinema good actors. Indian cinema very colorful. Indian cinema very popular. I passed the exam at 65% marks. That is the origin of my involvement with this region. Then I went to Baghdad, I went to Sanaa and absolutely I loved the region. And I went very deep into its history and politics and constantly. So the ministry found that their investment had worked. Here is a fellow we needed. I was sent to New York. After all these postings, I went to New York. In New York, I had hardly been there a year. I got very bored. I had nothing to do. I was in the consulate doing commercial work 
except that the American commercial sector knew about uh, the Indian commercial sector far more than I did and therefore didn't need my services at all. Indians also knew more about New York than I did and they didn't need my services at all. So I used to spend most of the day reading newspapers. Luckily, there were several or eight newspapers. So I would start my day with New York Times, move to Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and then I would read Time Magazine, Newsweek, etc. I was extremely well educated and well informed, but completely underemployed. <laughs> so the ministry then came to know that this is a person dissatisfied. So I got a phone call said, would you like to move to Jeddah? My original, the whole purpose of my appointment in the ministry was to go to Jeddah. So the additional secretary said, Hum aapko satana nahi chahate, lekin hum chahate hai ki aap jadde chale jayi. I don't know what happened. I was muttering, ah, whether I should go or not, children will be disrupted. So he said, chalo, thik hai. They waited another year and odd and I found myself in Jeddah. I did four years in Jeddah. And it's not easy. As you can imagine, handling Hajj, a person who had never visited a mosque in his life was handling 30,000 Indian pilgrims and I was found wanting in all departments, grossly inadequate in terms of application of the faith. But I studied, I learned, I studied a lot. I learned about Mecca and Medina, about the faith. I tried to improve arrangements relating to Hajj. Every Indian Muslim leader in India became my enemy because I suggested changes. I suggested reform in terms of the management of Hajj. There was an article about me in the Blitz in those days. There used to be an Urdu Blitz at the back. I was in my Bangala for 15th August or 26th January and they said, tell me Zahmat, symbol of corruption. That was the compliment to me for all the efforts I had been making to revamp Hajj arrangements. Anyway, you have to soldier on, you have to do what you had to do. And because any innovation in our country means that you are stepping on the toes of people who have vested interests in the present arrangement. So I was actively despised. And that became a pattern. Every time I went to Saudi Arabia, I would tamper with the, these Hajj arrangements and I would make even more enemies. And there was a lot of, when I was posted as ambassador to Saudi Arabia, a letter went to the king of Saudi Arabia, and to this crown prince Abdullah bin Abdulaziz, saying, this man is an alcoholic. He drinks alcohol in Mecca and Medina. He is unfit to be the Indian ambassador. Please don't appoint him. It was written by a man who rejoiced in the name of Dudwala. So Mr. Dudwala's letter arrived in the king's palace and then inquiry was commissioned. But since I had served in Saudi Arabia before, they knew that whatever my follies and foibles, at least I would not consume alcohol in the holy city. I think they knew that. But in any case, at some stage, I got the Ogrima and I arrived in Saudi Arabia. And uh, once I was there as ambassador, within one year, the towers fell. World Trade Center towers fell right in front of my eyes on television screen. And I thought to myself, this is going to reverberate for many, many years to come. And it's going to impact on our ties, India's ties with the region. And since I'm the one who has served all these five or six places, I might as well stay in the region. So my folly got further compounded. I informed the ministry that I would like to remain in this region. The ministry said, here is someone who is very dangerous. He's actually asked for a posting. He wants to stay in the region. And I had, so I thought that I would be welcome. I would go to Iran, I would go to Egypt, I would, you know, get to know. The ministry posted me to Zimbabwe. And I was shocked. I said, here is a guy who wants to work in the region and I have, been, I have no problem with Zimbabwe and I look forward to seeing great Zimbabwe and the Victoria Falls. But I thought to myself, it's a, it's a bit of a waste. I've got so many, not that many posts, uh, post, uh, years left in service. I know Victoria Falls and I can write poetry there. But is it really what I need to do and maybe I can contribute a little more. 
So I wrote to a friend of mine in the PMO saying that, take a look. I don't think, I think this region needs me more than Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe had not had a mission, I mean, had not had a high commissioner for a year before and did not have for a year after. I was to be that interim appointment. So review was done, councils were held, people were consulted. And finally, I got the appointment in, in, in Muscat, Oman. Not because of any merit of mine, because my predecessor had done something seriously foolish. It is very rare in our service, but it happened occasionally. So the ministry in its wisdom called him and gave him a far better appointment. And I was told, you go to Oman now. And I was told on the phone, you say yes now, otherwise you are going to Zimbabwe. So the story of my specialization in the region has this background. But you have to soldier on, as we know. <laughs> so I went to Oman. I loved Oman. Absolutely loved Oman. And I thought to myself, I don't care where I am located. I am ambassador, self-appointed ambassador to West Asia and North Africa. Self-appointed. I said, I used to write learned notes, long notes, 20 pages, 30 pages, discussing this, discussing this. I exercised the fundamental right to write. And my ministry exercised the fundamental right not to read. So it was a perfect arrangement. I wrote, nobody read it. And that is how we continued there. Once I was in Muscat, I got a phone call. You know, the government changed in May. And I got a phone call from Mr. Mani Shankar here and said, I want you to join my ministry. At that time, I was in Baghdad trying negotiating the release of hostages who had been caught, drivers who had been sent from Kuwait to Iraq. And they had been kidnapped and uh, there was a big ransom demand for them. So I, 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 the last thing I wanted was a career <laughs> change and think about the future when I was not sure about the welfare of these chaps. And I knew and I knew absolutely that if I am not successful in rescuing these people, <laughs> I, it will haunt me for the rest of my life personally. And wherever I go on the streets of Delhi, they will say, this ki wajah se log mare gai. And if I am successful, nobody will remember it. Exactly that happened. Luckily, they were all successful. So I went and joined Mani Shankar. Everybody told me, don't join, don't join, don't join, because money is not going to last for a long time. But I said, I can't say no to him. I know him for so long. So I joined the petroleum ministry. And yes, absolutely, within one year, he was moved on and became minister for sports and youth. And I was unemployed. And unemployable because I was tainted. I had left the ministry to join. So then I looked around here and there, no post available. I became head of Sapru House, Indian Council of World Affairs. I loved it. Foreign Secretary told me people will not be happy with this appointment. They will think that it's a useless appointment, but I don't, but I think you are suitable for it. And I agreed with him. And I loved being in Sapru House. I loved it. It was a place associated with Jawaharlal Nehru who used to come personally there to discuss foreign policy issues. It was the first foreign policy think tank in, the, in all of Asia, 1942. It had hosted the Asian Relations Conference. So that is what happened. During all this period, the reading and writing that I did, I finally thought I should write about this. I had written other books, Reform in the Arab World, Children of Abraham at War, uh, Islam after Arab Spring, I wrote Islamic contentions in West Asia, but a substantial work. So at that time, the publisher approached me and I agreed to write a book, except I didn't write it. And about two years passed, it remained on my conscience, but I didn't write anything. Then the pandemic occurred. And one and a half years of the pandemic produced this. Without the, I know pandemic has been a horrible experience for all of us. And for, for all of us, it has been a personal tragedy as well. But without that, I would not have. I started focus. We had nothing else to do. There was a lockdown and you were so not safe to go out. So we, I wrote it. It has been a labor of love. It is addressed to all of you. I had in mind Indians who are curious about the region who want to know what is happening. What do they read in newspapers? Sometimes war, conflict, uh, extremist violence, oil affairs, and uh, you know various, various confusing events. 
I thought that I will link the dots, that I will give a coherent narrative so that everyone in India he now is able to appreciate the significance of this relationship. Where have these people come from? What are the wellsprings of the various matters that come up from time to time? And where is this region going? I gave it a subtitle, Repression, Resistance and Great Power Games. The subtitle came at the end. The title had been given two or three years earlier before I had written a single word because all around me was war. So West Asia at war. You had the war in Syria and Yemen. You and the Islamic State had engaged, had, had fought in Iraq and Syria and occupied a third of the countries concerned and they were carrying out heinous acts of violence. And therefore, there was West Asia at war. But I didn't have the subtitles. The pattern, the picture that I got of repression and resistance emerged after I had finished the book. So I wrote the introduction after all the book had been written. A difficult chapter was the last one. I hate it after making so much effort to write something negative, to end on a negative note. That's what is it all about. I mean, life is not worth it if, if, if the future is so hopeless. So I wrestled with myself quite a lot. The last two paragraphs are the ones that I finally wrote and which I will present before you. So since Gautam has told me to read some portions of the book to give you a flavor of what I think has been happening in the book, in the region. After the first hundred years, the Arab world had the same renaissance that we had in that period. The same stalwarts, the same self-introspection, the same desire to reform and change. And yet in their case, it went nowhere. So I have asked this question. The Islamic world was traumatized by these defeats. For being believers in the message of Islam, they had been assured by Allah of the resilience of their faith in the face of all non-believers, an assurance that had been repeatedly proven accurate over several centuries. With this defeat, the search for an explanation instigated a profound introspection when the region's best minds applied themselves to obtain answers. Why then did this effort falter, this excitement wither away, so that as the century ended and the world stood at the edge of war, the Arab appeared much worse off than when Napoleon had clambered onto Egypt's shores in 1798. The serious error the intellectuals made was to believe that the Europeans would be their partners in progress, would actually facilitate the required reforms. However, this was never part of the Western agenda. As the decades of the 19th century moved forward, European avarice for territory, raw materials and natural resources increased so that trade was quickly replaced by, it was replaced by imperial domination. Local resistance was robust and consistent and produced several heroes in the region. Abdul Qadir, Khairuddin, Muhammad Ahmed, Muhammad Urabi, all of them were ultimately cut down. The sense of racial and civilizational superiority now pervaded the Western world, represented by hard governors and ruthless armies. A small portion now, just to tell you, how the Arab world was then divided. The, after the inspiration of Nasser, there was the collapse of this nationalism project after 67. And then there was this extraordinary turmoil in 1979. Much of what had happened in the region up to this date, that 1979, is linked with Palestine and its people. The period began with the Nakba, catastrophe of the 1948 war, moved 28 later, then moved 20 years later to the bigger tragedy of 1967, when all prospects of Palestinian redemption were permanently lost and ended with the Arab states resolutely moving away 
from the from the vision of transnational Arab fraternity. They shifted then to assertions of narrower commitment centering on the state. The very states that had been so casually drawn on paper by Sykes and Pico and given life by the Versailles Agreements of 1919 to 2022. They had suited the immediate aspirations and interests of two imperial powers, Britain and France. As the Palestinians became a lost cause for other Arabs, what did the non-Palestinian Arab do with the newfound opportunity to shape independent statehood? The carnage of 1967 pulled away Egypt from the broader Arab fold as it was replaced and as it replaced the dream of pan-Arabism with the narrower celebration of the older pharaonic past. This was, a cherished, uh, this was a cherished memory, certainly, but surely it was much too far away to resonate with the people desperate for the magic wand of political glory and economic miracle that Nasser had briefly waved before them and then faded from history as the people placed on his shoulders alone the blame for the collective failure of the entire community. Sadat, uh, Sadat sought peace with Israel and the return of lost territories so that he could work on his real priorities, the political and economic advancement of Egypt. Camp David was a strategic triumph for Israel since it broke Arab ranks and Israel could now pursue what it really wanted, a united capital, Jerusalem, and space on the West Bank where its people could settle in substantial numbers. Thus, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 found its final realization 60 years later. As Sadat bowed in prayer at Al-Aqsa in 1977, he bowed not before Allah, but before the state of Israel. Israel in victory has declared, uh, has displayed no magnanimity, no sense of accommodation with its foes. Decade after decade, leader after leader, it has insisted on its maximalist claims, insensitive about the privation it inflicts on its Palestinian cousins, unmindful of the holy wisdom that for triumph to last, it should be clothed in modesty. The sense of long grievance against vast sections of humankind for the pain of the pogrom, the humiliation of the ghetto, the 2000 year experience of exclusion and the crowning wound of the Holocaust. All of these have taken away from most Israelis the spirit of moderation, of tolerance, of charity, and placed them and their neighbors in a constant state of, of insecurity and fear and the constant dread of war. The last part. What then, what then does West Asia look like now? After a hundred years, not a single Arab state provides for any modicum of popular participation in state decision making. National financial accounts remain non-transparent and without accountability. Though oil wealth is depleting, its revenues are still being used to back state efforts at co-option and coercion, the latter now becoming more open, more crude, more vicious and more frequent. Can this change? Every parameter of state order analyzed by experts suggests that this system is not sustainable. But there is no indication of who or what will be the catalyst for change. State powers have offered no evidence that they can lead reform from the top and carry their people to the life they reserve as, as citizens. Their Western allies, as they speak of freedom and recall the Enlightenment as their gift to humankind, sit on the sidelines and wait for their next defense contract. But popular resistance remains vibrant as demonstrations across the region voice popular discontent with their plight and deeper unhappiness with their sense of being excluded from the march of history 
towards participation in governance as free citizens. As, as free you know, citizens. This spirit is best exemplified by the resistance of the Palestinians. Though frequently violated, abused, betrayed, and killed in large numbers, it has never been stilled. Not for a day. They still raise their hands to throw rocks at their occupiers and take bullets on their chest in the hundreds, looking for that day when Jews and Arabs will live side by side in peace. Such opposition is always met with coercion, with brute force, as regional tyrants, abetted by their foreign accomplices, continue to accumulate the capabilities to combat resistance, the prospect of successful change across West Asia and North Africa remains very remote. Let me quickly hand the microphone to Alwait, who is our discussant for today, and mm -hmm. let uh, Alwait throw up some questions which Ambassador um, Tarmiz Ahmad can take on. But uh, Alwait, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, it is, I express my gratitude to Bambawale sir and Raya sir for reaching out to me to be a part of this very interesting program. Uh, I was a little bit skeptic. Uh, to be a discussion of this book because uh, this is a huge uh, contribution made by sir, and I would not be able to do justice if I uh, don't know, you know, the integrity of what uh, the book uh, talks about. But I have gone through the book except a couple of chapters uh, which I couldn't finish. Uh, but then uh, it's uh, the title of the talk, uh, the book is very uh, catchy, and as mentioned by. Uh, Ahmed sir, uh, he has given quite a bit of his explanation why he has chosen this title. And to me, uh, the release of this book has, uh, the juncture at which this book is released, uh, is very significant, very timely. Uh, and I'm saying this because of the arguments sir has made in some of the chapters, particularly towards the end. Uh, I completely agree with what sir has mentioned that the last bit of the, uh, of the chapters was pretty uh, intriguing. Uh, it really keeps you, uh, makes you stay put uh, with, the, with the subject matter and makes you think of over lots of things uh, which is happening in West Asia. Uh, so to say. Just to begin with, the, there are 12 chapters in this book and uh, all the chapters, uh, one thing that I could see uh, while I was going through the book is the meticulousness uh, of the details uh, you know, that have been used by ambassadors. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the ideas, the facts, and the figures. And uh, I could see many young friends from our school uh, who have studied West Asia. And unfortunately, we couldn't have some of the uh, junior uh, uh, students. Uh, I but they should read this book because we have, uh, and of course, for everybody who would like to know what West Asia is all about and the, the changes that have come about in the region right from the Till today, sir has beautifully drafted, documented in his uh, 400 odd uh, pages book. I will not go into the details of uh, uh, of, the, of each and every chapters, but uh, just to you know, start off with the title: repression, resistance, and the great power games. You know, these are something that we have seen in, in the in the region uh, since uh, several years. But if we look at in today's juncture also, we can still apply some of this. Uh, Repression, resistance, and great powers. Repression of whom? Sir has explained that about the internal dynamics in the region, the security challenges being faced by the Palestinians, by the, the Yemenis, and the Syrians, and repression by the, you know, according to the, the book, tyrants and the leaders. And the resistance also has been uh, uh, described very, uh, very lucidly uh, in terms of the resistance from the outsiders as well as from the insiders. And what we are seeing right now is we have certain elements uh, inside the region in terms of resistance within the region that we can see uh, inside uh, inside Syria, what's happening right now for the last 11 years. We have seen that for a brief period of time in Iraq, uh, which has extended beautifully. 
Am I audible? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. And in terms of resistance, uh, we have seen, uh, we are currently seeing that uh, in CPR. And Sir also has beautifully drafted the chronological uh, evolution of what we call it as ISIS in one of the chapters, uh, tracing back to some of the roots in the early part of 2000s, particularly after the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. And then we have this great power games. And this is something which I really, uh, which I found very interesting. Uh, and Sir hasn't explained that, uh, you know, he has taken a journey in almost all the chapters uh, to explain what great power games is all about in West Asia. Uh, particularly earlier, we had seen how it was a battlefield for the Soviet Union and also for the UK and the US came a little later, uh, particularly after uh, 1950, uh, particularly from 1950s onwards, and US had begun to establish itself as one of the biggest uh, player in the region from the early part of 1970s. But if you see today, uh, there is also a, 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 you know, a perception that the US interest in the region is in decline, and which we have found a mention of in, this, in, in one of the chapters when Sir talked about uh, the, uh, the perceived decline of the United States and why. But at the same time, there is also some sort of a, a simultaneous uh, making of another block being laid by, say, Turkey, Iran, and Russia. China is on the one hand, uh, but on the other side, you have a grouping being led by Saudi Arabia, Israel, and some of the Sunni Gulf countries, uh, which is uh, you know, going to be an interesting game in the region right now. We are going to see whether it is going to be a competition between the major powers or is it going to be a competition between these blocks. But at the same time, what have what I found very interesting is uh, the realignment of relations Sir has talked in a uh, few chapters about the geopolitical realignments in the region. Uh, while we have seen uh, uh, you know, lots of problems between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and the other uh, Gulf countries since 2017 and since uh, 2016, particularly with Iran and Saudi Arabia. There is also a gradual process uh, uh, being made or steps being made by these countries to reconcile uh, in the last few years. And in fact, in the last few months, uh, we have seen a number of visits between uh, the leaders from both the sides. Uh, so, there is a continuous process of evolution, uh, geopolitical evolution in the region. And as we say, for some of us who have been studying the region and who have been the student of this region for the last many years, there's never a dull moment in West Asia. And whatever we see uh, cannot be predicted, whatever unpredictability is the word uh, when we talk about the geopolitics of West Asia. Uh, who would have thought that uh, you know, the, 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 the Israeli prime minister would be few days ago, or who would have thought that, uh, you know, there would be this sort of a, a normalization between Israel and some of the Arab countries uh, from the region and also from north, northern part of Africa. Uh, one of the chapters, that is the last chapter when Sir talk about the Malays, uh, the social Malays and the political Malays, I found the chapter very, uh, very interesting. Why I'm saying this is because as much as the uh, the, the, the particularly the Gulf countries are trying to go for a reform in order to improve their image, uh, uh, in order to change their perception, uh, outside perception of who they are actually. There is also a very latent uh, uh, potential uh, uh, time bomb which is ticking inside the region. That is in terms of the social political reforms, social economic reforms, which countries like Saudi Arabia is undergoing right now. Uh, Ahmed sir has mentioned about the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and his uh, Vision 2030 uh, initiative. Uh, with a little bit of uh, you know reading that I have done, I could also agree you know with what sir has mentioned that it is you know taken to be more of a one-man show, trying to fulfill his own desire and his interests rather than taking into consideration a wider uh, interest of the public. And he, I think, very well knows the fact that, which Sir, which sir has mentioned in the book, that uh, there is a potential challenge, uh, which may not be the case right now, but in the long time, there could be a potential challenge from the wider Saudi public. That is also the reason why he has tried to uh, garner the support of the youth, uh, who are not uh, uh, very much you know, attached to the traditional values, 
but would want to be on par with some of their peers in different parts of the world. Something we call it modernization or westernization, uh, which is not very much the case in Saudi Arabia uh, since the last uh, many, many years. Uh, another chapter that is on US, Rightly uh, uh, mentioned again at the beginning of the, uh, uh, the chapter about the uncertainty of what Joe Biden is going to be doing uh, in, 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 in West Asia. Uh, is it going to be finally out completely uh, because they have another headache in, in, in the Indo-Pacific region, would like to invest more resource and would like to invest more uh, uh, ideas to, to tackle certain problems coming out of China. Uh, so that remains to be seen, and Sir has mentioned about the uncertainty of what Joe Biden is going to be uh, doing in West Asia uh, in the times to come. Uh, there are a few questions which I would like to pose to Sir. Uh, question in the sense that uh, some sort of a, uh, you know idea. Uh, firstly, uh, it's about the uh, Sir has mentioned about how you know the region in the Red Sea area has become a little bit militarized in the last. A uh, few years, uh, sir talked about hope, foremost, sir, the initiative of maritime security. Uh, there is a there is a construct, there is there is a planning being done by Iran to increase the uh, you know the naval presence in 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 the Red Sea by having some sort of a you know uh, a group, uh, like-minded countries to be a part of the program. But at the same time, you have sir international maritime security construct uh, that's begun by the United States. The same region. So, how do we see? Uh, are we going to see some sort of a competition in this region uh, in terms of you know, naval powers competing for uh, access to the sea and controlling the maritime sea route, or is it going to be just a mere exercise and also for the benefit of the entire region? Uh, this is something I would like to know from uh, Ahmed sir, uh, because in the last uh, three to four years' time, we have seen number of uh, activities in, in the Red Sea, uh, which could have flare up, which could have really destroyed or disrupt uh, the international maritime sea uh, trade between different uh, uh, different countries. So, uh, how do you go about it? Uh, you want to respond this first? And yes, uh, the, the concluding part of the book. Uh, you know, Sir concluded the book on a very cautious note. Uh, while we have West Asia really developing uh, tremendously in terms of its foreign relations with different countries, uh, the socio-economic uh, aspects, uh, uh, you know, continues to remain uh, continues to remain a, a major uh, trigger of uh, unrest in the region. So, how does Sir see that uh, having served in almost all the important countries? Uh, Oman, UAE, and uh, Saudi Arabia, particularly in Oman and Saudi Arabia, there were already signals coming out during the Arab Spring also, but then uh, we didn't see and hear much about what the internal uh, security has done to suppress uh, the, uh, the uprisings from coming out in the public. And also another aspect on the Jordanian monarchy. Uh, I have found a mention of Jordanian monarchy being shaky right now. Uh, you know, because if you see in the region, countries like Egypt, Jordan, uh, play a very important role uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, setting, the, setting the differences between uh, uh, Israel and uh, Palestinians and Hamas. But how does uh, Sir see uh, the evolving nature of the rule inside Jordan? Uh, so I'll leave that for now, sir, uh, once we have the answer. Uh, what I want to do is now, let's have a conversation, not just between the three of us, but all of us. Let's open it up. So I'm going to hand the microphone to Ambassador Ahmad to answer some of these questions. I'm going to add one or two questions of my own. But as soon as that is over, if any one of you wants to jump in, just put your hand up and we'll allow. Let's make it a larger conversation in this entire auditorium so that we, we have a discussion amongst all of us. Uh, I have two specific questions, Ambassador Ahmed, uh, taking off from where al ended. Uh, one is, you know, especially in the last part that you read uh, was very depressing because Asia is rising and West Asia should also be changing towards participatory politics. But I think in your book and from what you read to us, uh, this you don't see this happening. So am I right in making that assumption? Am I right in making that conclusion? That's 
question number one. Question number two is you have uh, touched upon the quad, and I'm not talking of the Indo-Pacific quad, but the second quad or the quad two, as you call it, which is Israel, India, USA, and UAE. Uh, any future of in that? So I'll I'll hand that I'll hand the microphone to Ambassador Ahmad. He's going to take some time in answering all these questions, but I do hope to see some hands raised from amongst you. I'll I'll come to you in a little while. Very quickly, the first question is about the maritime scenario from the India, across the Indian Ocean, but specifically the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. For far too long, the Persian Gulf has been the center of competition and conflict. And it was meant to be the trigger for any major region-wide conflagration. But I would add to that now concerns relating to the Red Sea. Red Sea also had Babel Mandir at one level, at one end and the Suez Canal at the other. Alarm bells relating to the Red Sea should have sounded when the ship blocked the Suez Canal for six days and caused billions of dollars of loss. That means we have got used to free passage. And when that ship remained there for six days, I started wondering, I had no knowledge of the Suez Canal. And it's important. So we just took it for granted that ships go back and forth. The Suez Canal connects Asia with the Mediterranean and Europe. But when I read about it, I realized it is a very, this whole region is extremely fragile and conflict ridden. Just look at the Red Sea alone, this very narrow body of water. Has Egypt, the Sinai, very turbulent, full of conflict. Israel, a very narrow inlet at Islet and the Gulf of Aqaba. Come to Saudi Arabia, very long terrain, and then you come to Yemen. And at Yemen, you know that the Yemen that the Emiratis have become the significant role player, geopolitical role players in this. They control today Mocha and Aden. And uh, in the Arabian Sea, at the Arabian Sea they control three ports. They control Perim Island, which is at the entrance of the Babel Mandir. They control, they have three or four bases in Somaliland, Somaliland and Puntland. And uh, they are therefore all over the place. They also control Sopotra. They have built up very close ties with the Israelis. So the Israeli Navy now is very active in the Red Sea, in the Gulf of Aden, and in the Gulf of Omar. And from time to time, they have skirmishes with the, with, the, with the Iranians. And therefore, this is a very major area. This is a waterway that, to my mind, is a, this is a space for considerable concern. But just look across. You have Egypt today in competition with Ethiopia. You have South Sudan, extremely turbulent. You, have, you, you then have Eritrea, which is which has been turbulent for a very long time. You have Djibouti, which has six bases, naval bases of foreign countries. And you have Somalia that is falling apart in front of our eyes. And you have civil conflict within Ethiopia itself. So if you look at this region, to my mind, if anyone ever asked me if there's going to be a future conflict, it's going to be here. And this is referred to as the Horn of Africa. I don't think there has been an academic paper written about the Horn of Africa in years. This is something which we will need to study uh, for a long time. And this is where Indian interests lie. I have been a critic of Quad 1 and now of course of Quad 2. Quad 1, I felt that it has nothing to do with India. What is the Indian Navy crossing Malacca and going into South China Sea? For us, the Indian Ocean begins at Malacca and goes up to the East African coast. A crucial space. <laughs> of, of strategic value for India is the Arabian Sea and the two waterways of uh, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. And this is where we have to focus, not Quad 1. Quad 1 is an American concern and the Americans are fully capable of taking care of their interests. And of course, in order to remind us where the crucial interests lie, they have got AUKUS. So Australia, UK. UK which has gone away from us has got two crippled ships roaming around the Indian Ocean pretending to be a big power. And this is what you have. 
let them do occur let them do what they wish i personally see uh, personally see it as no strategic value but the americans selling their weaponry to these australians australians have paid nearly a billion dollars in fine to the french because they cancelled the contract to accommodate these americans and this these, uh, these uh, submarines are going to come to the australian in 2040 great strategic value thank you now india we why does what is india's maritime interest and where what are we doing about it if anyone knows please do guide me but i am not aware or india is strategic interest end at the border of india this is the way i have seen it i know there is a separate different song being sung elsewhere which speaks of the great nation that has emerged under the messianic leadership but i am deeply concerned because i don't see any strategic vision i don't see a longer term plan for long term indian interest important matters are taking place right around us and we are nowhere to be seen i have rung alarm bells with regard to russia and china spreading all across eurasia look at the connectivity they have already established and we are not there we have to this is the challenge for it we have a challenge in eurasia and we have a challenge in the western indian ocean so if anyone were to ask me what is the outlook for india this is the space that we should be looking at and hopefully we will see where it goes with regard to the socio economic you see this is something which fascinated people <laughs> every one of us looks at uh, looks at uh, this region of west asia and think of dubai abu dhabi doha magnificent world's greatest infrastructure but when you look at west asia north africa as a whole you see very major spaces of poverty of deprivation of exclusion of unemployment and that is the source even with regard i mean that is the source that is the source of the malaise even in the gulf countries the richest countries in the world you have extraordinary unemployment because the people prefer foreigners foreigners do most of the work even as professionals even as business persons they and these guys their own nationals their youth live on dole it is a very serious problem at the heart of the political order this is a political order that is non transparent non accommodative non inclusive is it sustainable and i have argued in my book that it is not sustainable but i don't know when and how it will change i don't know the arab spring gave us certain promise and some of us hoped that a message would be received in the palaces of the gulf that yes we need to do something we need to change but we are seeing the opposite not only are we seeing very robust resistance to the idea of change even those entities that had begun to experiment with change have been overturned tunisia a very fragile democratic order had emerged but the interventions of uae and saudi arabia have ensured that we have a constitutional dictatorship sudan which was always very unstable and a very uneasy coalition of civilian and military role which was supposed to move slowly limpingly towards a democratic order you know it has been reversed completely again the intervention of the uae so you have we have a problem there for which there is no ready solution we still have oil revenues but the oil revenues are going down i have already indicated here that we are seeing the rise of coercion much more than co-option and i served in the region of co-option as i always quote a friend of mine in saudi arabia i said how come you guys are not protesting he said every time i open my mouth to protest the king puts more money into it so <laughs> uh, but you see that money is running out and there will be problems so many scholars far better informed than i am have written about the financial issues ahead of me many others have written about the socio economic concerns some have written about cultural issues so every parameter that you discuss shows the region to be seriously deficient so you are finally left with coercion 
There is today the fear, the greatest fear in the Gulf is not about Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, not about extremist Islam at all, because they can handle that. They can handle that very harshly. It is from political Islam. It is from the Muslim brother. The Muslim brotherhood gives the option, gives the alternative of a political order anchored in Islam, but otherwise, uh, uh, you know, I mean, about, I mean, otherwise uh, upholding values of parliamentary democracy. That is the enemy for this region. And that is why you have seen the harsh action that they have taken against the Muslim Brotherhood rather than against Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. So there is a problem. I, I cannot tell you how much I tormented myself. The last three or four paragraphs cost me a lot. But I, at the end of the day, I had to be honest. I wanted to end it with my last paragraph, my second last paragraph. I wanted to end on hope that the Palestinians will finally triumph. And perhaps they will. But then this gnawing sense of reality, you can't ignore this. It's staring at you. The coercion, the coercive powers that are available. And the coercive powers are not just with UAE and Saudi Arabia. They are today aligning themselves with the Israelis, and the Israelis are giving them surveillance equipment of the state of the kind equipment for that. Every phone call of yours, every internet message of yours, everything that you take a deep breath and it is recorded somewhere. And they say, Is you for another recognition? And they catch you and they put you in. They see your internet activity and you are inside. So we have, so this is kind of, it is a kind of collaboration among the hard right. And then, of course, we have our American brothers who hate democracy outside their show. They have never encouraged democracy, but democracy means a free people having their own aspirations and wanting to be independent of the Americans. That is why they have had such difficulties with us and they have difficulties. They love these dictators. And that is why you find the Americans but always back them. And now you see Biden coming hat in hand, begging MBS to forgive him for his bad remarks earlier and to once again cohabit with the Americans. We have seen this happen as a pattern. And if you feel the region is so angry against the West, I have argued in my book, it will surprise some of you, that Islamic extremism was a form of resistance against these tyrants and, and their American mentors. 9-11 fell because of the atrocities the Americans had perpetrated in this region, about which we know so little. How many of us know that on the first day of the American assault upon Iraq, 100,000 Iraqis were killed in carpet bombing in a few hours? And these same people have the temerity to speak about Ukraine? These people do. In order to liberate uh, the Muslim from the Islamic State, the Americans bombed Muslim, 20,000 people were killed. In order to get rid of Gaddafi, the Americans and the other allies bombed Tripoli, 40,000 dead in order to overthrow Gaddafi. Not of, this is not part of their consciousness. Who created the jihad in this region? Does any, you ask any American, he talks of Saudi Arabia, and there's something seriously wrong with Muslims and Islam. It is the Americans. They constructed Al-Qaeda. They constructed Osama bin Laden. They constructed Abdullah Azram. They provided the weaponry. They provided the funding. Saudi Arabia and Pakistan came on board. It's always somebody else's fault. So we have a problem in the region. And that is why I have said repression, resistance and great power. But the resistance has never abated. I have given that as a pattern. I didn't know it earlier. The pattern emerged after I finished my book. I said, look at this. These guys have never given up. And look at the atrocities committed. Do we know in the 19th century, while we were basking in our renaissance. These French were killing hundreds of thousands of people in North Africa. We didn't experience that. So there has been a very different pattern of imperial rule in this region compared to what we went through. So we had a renaissance. We then had a freedom movement. We had Government of India Acts 1909, 1990, 1935. No atrocities of the kind that these people experienced. Yes, we had Jalyan Walaba, but none of the atrocities that these people went through and they were suppressed and they are dominated to this day. Therefore, you ask this question, which is what it is linked. 
Asia is rising and West Asia is not. You know, I have a, I must, as you were asking, I got even more depressed. Because West Asia is flush with money. And if you are flush with money, certainly for the short term you are going to do well. Today, what is the language that you hear from the Emiratis? You are not told that so many hundred are in jail because they did internet activity with regard to the Muslim Brotherhood. You hear of technology, frontier of technology. They are the ones who are going to be the hub of technological revolution. These are the guys who are going into space. They are going into cyberspace. They are going into IT. So they are a very robust hub, the Emiratis. Only thing they ask of you, don't get into politics. The politics to the royal family, the rest, everything you have a place to have. What is happening there, if you look at the, if you scrutinize actual change, the commitment to technology that began 10 years ago was meant to transform the Emirati. What they have done instead is to recruit several million more foreigners. No Emirati has changed. The Emirati is not more technologically qualified than he was 10 years ago. The foreigners are doing his work as they have done before. So the outlook is very mixed and complex to me. It is on the one hand, according to me, inherently flawed, inherently weak. It is like a hollow shell. But on the surface, it glitters. It's likely to glitter. And that is what they are tapping into. If the Saudis have a conference for the uh, for the you know, investors conference. The who's who of the international community will show up because they want those billions of dollars and don't mention the enlightenment to us. That's what they do. You go where the money is. So money is there. It will be there for some more years. So you will have this dichotomy of glitter on the one hand, extraordinary glitter on one hand, and a deep-seated malaise on the other. Quote 2, don't ask me. I go berserk. Quote 2 was a joke. And it was a joke that had, I don't know what it was all about. The Indian External Affairs Minister is on a bilateral visit with the, he goes to Tel Aviv, stroke Jerusalem. Three people, UAE, Israel and have gone to the United States a week earlier. There has been a meeting of foreign ministers. Just come back. A week later, the Indian External Affairs Minister happens to be in Tel Aviv. Suddenly, there is an online meeting for two hours of these four countries. Three have already met, live, in person, in Washington. The fourth gentleman, our minister, happens to be there and it's an online meeting. Look at the briefing that was done. What to? India is the solicited partner. Everyone wants to partner India. Today, the region has joined India against China. China is the closest friend of all of these people. Where is China? The world has joined India against China. And Arab wrote, no, no. India has opted with the Gulf countries against Iran. No mention. It was a chimera. It seemed like an alternative reality that was being discussed. So I wrote over there. I had to discuss it because it happened while I was finishing the book. And as I finished with it, I said, this is an embarrassment. It is theatre as an end in itself, I wrote. But thankfully, the theatre will end because the entire show will sink into its own irrelevance. Exactly that has happened. Nobody has heard of Quad 2 from October last year till today. It has gone into the irrelevance that it is not. We must take a few questions from the floor. We are running out of time, really. But I, I see a hand. I think Mrs. Patgonkar had a hand up. So if we could get, give her the microphone. And then there's a hand up at the back there. So if we can give the lady at the back, one of our students from Symbiosis. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, hello, Mr. Ahmed. I've written her four words. And those men were meant uh, as four questions. But I think a couple of them are going to be reading now. You've already tackled them. But what you haven't told the audience is about <coughs> the great power games. You've only done it on the surface. That's number one. Number two, I would also like your idea about why this Arab Spring has just diminished and died out. Is it something in the Arab character that is this? Thirdly, I think in your book you spoke of narrow nationalisms. So 
Nehru, if you could speak a little bit about narrow nationalism. And lastly, and lastly, uh, once we had a happy discussion and I had spoken about rise and falls of civilization according to the French theorist Renan Brudel. And it seems to me that what is happening in the Arab world today, in the Muslim world today, is after a period of when it really flourished in every domain, it uh, flourished in the arts, it flourished in mathematics, it flourished in navigation, and it flourished in astronomy, in poetry, and it was had conquered a lot parts of Europe. And now it's a shriveling civilization. Shriveling civilization. We couldn't figure out what was the last reference. Do you think about Iran? No, no. I was saying that there was a time right from the 8th century up to the 14th century or so when the Arab civilization, the Muslim civilization, Arab civilization. Uh -huh, was really at its height and it glorified the world with the different fields in which it excelled. I got it, yes. You know, whether it was the literature, arts, music, politics, whatever, it ruled a part of Europe. And today you get the feeling that this civilization is on the decline. You get that feeling. So it's a kind of a civilization wave that has gone up and has come down. Just uh, and then the last thing is that I found that a lot of the references that you had in your book were basically Western authors. Basically Western authors. The Western authors. The people you quoted. Western authors. Yeah, were basically Western authors. I don't really agree with that. Uh, lots of references to Arab and other authors. But anyway, that please answer the question. Like can, can we go no, to the uh, person at the back? Uh, easier to read Western authors than to read Arab authors. I was just Poetry. Yeah, Arab authors. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Samanya. Firstly, congratulations, sir, on the launch of your book. And uh, my question was that Ovidra talks about reviving JCPOA. And Iran's been on the offensive. There are also reports that Iran is on the verge of a nuclear breakout. So what do you think would be, what does it mean for the collective future of West Asia is my question. Very quickly. Very quickly. Great power games, I didn't elaborate on it because the narrative is... Uh, very clear, Britain and France in the 19th century, and then uh, the Cold War, but the US, the, 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 we have the departure of the British, uh, east of Suez, and then you have the Americans coming in, and I have three or four chapters on American role in the region. And Great Power Games is the narrative of intervention. Intervention by subverting normal political processes in the region, asserting their own interest. The, the, the way they are able to be successful, the reason they are successful is because the regime depends on them. So when the Americans provide security there in the region, it's not security for the region, it's security for these royal families. So there is a conflation between the royal family and the state and the Americans because their long-term vested interests lie with the survival of these regimes. So there is this, uh, so this is a pattern and I have uh, elaborated on this very, very extensively. Uh, the American role began with the Iran-Iraq war. That is how the Americans first came in, uh, talking about the freedom of navigation and became major role players in the politics of the region. They also funded very robustly the Afghan Jihad, the global Jihad in Afghanistan. So the two conflicts went side by side with a central American role in both of them, a major role in both of them. Not, so not necessarily central, but a major role in both of them. Then they come into their own when Saddam Hussein occupies Kuwait. That's one of the great mysteries of West Asia. This dialogue between Saddam Hussein and April Claspie. I have talked about it in some detail in the book. That this US ambassador, Saddam Hussein asks, uh, what is your view about my claims on Kuwait? The answer that April Glassby gives is absolutely bewildering. She says the U.S. has no views on that. Our considered view has been that these matters should be resolved within the framework of the Arab League. 
and I have been given these instructions. This was what was told to me when I was a young officer, and this has been repeated to me by James Baker, Secretary of State, which means it's an instant instruction she has just got. Can you believe this? Can you believe that the United States, which is so intimately involved with West Asia, has no views about Saddam Hussein's occupation of Kuwait? So I have speculated that either we have an idiot or we have Saddam Hussein being entrapped. You know that the dictators who have served for far too long have hubris. It does something to their brain and they only hear what they wish to hear. So when he heard the word, we have no views on your he said, let me occupy it. And the conviction was at that time that we will get away with it because Americans are fatigued. James Baker met Tarek Aziz and told him that we have weaponry today, precision weaponry. We don't need soldiers. We will destroy you and we will send you to the old stone age, which is what they did. Saddam didn't believe him because we were influenced by the Vietnam War. And he said, these guys are fatigued. So the introduction of precision weaponry, which changed the course of the war, with hardly any American casualties, I think 30 or 40 or something against 100,000 one day, <laughs> and no army left after that. So we have this great power against it, sir. But then there is that point that I have set out. It's a great power with a lot of muscle, lot of brawn and almost negligible brain. They themselves have said, you get into these war zones, no planning, no end game, no resources, no time frame. You're stuck there for 20 years as a killing machine. But you don't know what you want. You don't know when to get out and you don't have the resources anyway. All of this is very, this is a pattern. Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya, all three. Devastated territories and Americans also they killed 700, 800,000 in Afghanistan, 5,000 American dead in Afghanistan. So nobody knows what they were doing there. Even they don't know. So it is truly a matter. This great power game. That's why I kept the word game, though I hate it. Because it's not a game for us. You know, gay for you is death for us. You know? <laughs> If you throw stones at the frog, he said, fun for you is death for us. That's what the pattern is and it continues today. Arab Spring has not died out. That is the song that I have sung so robustly. It has not died out. Just when you thought it has died out, it got revived. So in 2018, 2022, again you had four countries more, four heads of state resigned. It's not going to die. What they have is coercion. There's nothing to do with Arab character. My whole book is saying that there is resistance, persistent resistance. And how many bullets they've taken on their chest. Consistently, year after year, year after year, they keep on resisting. This is that thing. This is my, my main point. That there has been consistent resistance to repression. It has taken different shapes and forms. Initially, when the republics, firstly, there was the anti-colonial struggle. Large parts of West Asia and North Africa were then involved militarily. And of course, they were defeated and then killed in huge numbers. You know, in retaliation. Look, you may recall when the French came into Syria after the First World War, how many hundreds of Syrians they killed after they came in. They had all the weaponry from the First World War. These guys had nothing. So this is the pattern of, there was resistance, anti-colonial resistance. Then they planted all those potentates across West Asia and of course the, uh, they were overthrown one after the other. You had uh, Nasser and then in seven or eight countries had, that was the second. I am saying to you when they became tyrants and were defeated in 67 and then they broke that nationalism, you find extremist Islam emerges as a source of resistance. That then withers away and you have the Arab Spring. Arab Spring is not anchored in Islam. It is anchored in the principles that we all espouse. Freedom, dignity. You remember the slogan was Karama, Karama, Karama. Dignity. And dignity encompasses the entire agitation. I think the Arabs have done very well in terms of resistance. There is a question of an Arab character not accepting this. An Arab character, I think we should applaud this. That in spite of all the odds, they don't give up. They are not. Look at the Palestinian cause. 
from 1948 to date, there has not been a single day when they have not resisted. A third of the Palestinian population has been jailed. And you know what kind of beatings and broken forts has been official Israeli policy. Break the bones. Okay. And you know sniper attack. 80 of them dead in one day. They are unarmed. But they keep on coming. They keep on coming and they keep on coming. And it has not ended. Even for a day. Is that? I think that's something to be applauded. Nobody is witnessed. Constant betrayal. Constant abuse. Constant violence. And yet they are there every day. Coming out. Against the most formidable military power, they are there every day. I think we must note that and applaud it. Their narrow nationalism, you see what happened is in West Asia, you had this aspiration of Arab nationalism. You know, we are all Arab nationalism. And Nasser talked about that. It was a matter of concern for the rest because they thought if this guy takes over, what about us? We won't have any country to rule. So, at that time, as the republics emerged, they were, there was a conflict between state nationalism versus Arab nationalism. And there was deep discomfort with nationalism, particularly in Iran. After their own revolution, the last thing uh, General Qasem wanted was to have such as this fellow ruling nationalism. You tried that one experiment with Syria and it failed when you had the UAR. And it failed because Nasser took over Syria and made it a subordinate entity. And that experience told all the others, we are not going. We became state nationalism. But after 1967, the aura of Nasser was over. And 73, Sadat fought on his own, along with Syria, fought on his own. No Arab cause, Egyptian cause. Get those oil fields back, get Sinai back. Open the Suez Canal. That was so... That nationalism, pan-Arab nationalism, effectively ended with 67, and the death blow was the camp, you know, camp David Accord. So it's not, it's not narrow nationalism, it is state nationalism. So today nobody talks of Arab nationalism. They talk of state nationalism, and that's where we are. Today, even Saudi Arabia, which used to espouse Islamic identity, has become this talk about Saudi nationalism. Emiratis, who are 20% in the country, I talk of Emirati nationalism, Omani nationalism, Kuwaiti nationalism. So they are all now asserting new platforms for state mobilization for support, for whatever it is worth. Yes, you are absolutely right about Arab civilization. The only answer I will give, and I'll give it cautiously because you are far better informed than I am on civilizational matters. Civilizations flourish in environments of freedom, where the where the votaries of civilization enjoy a degree of freedom. Of course, in authoritarian regimes, some, some works of art have emerged and they have been applauded globally. But for an entire civilization to be vibrant and to become the center of the world in terms of its contribution, I think that you need freedom. I said freedom, but I am not in the pre-modern era. You don't have freedom of the kind we talk about. A kind of self-confidence, a kind of tolerance, moderate uh, approach. You see in the period of the Ottomans at their peak, the Mughals at their peak, uh, the Safavid at their peak, all of them contributed to world civilization when they were vibrant, when they were successful, self-confident. Imperialism ensured that does not happen. After that, it has withered away. Today, you have tyrants. They scrutinize every article you write, they scrutinize every book you write, you, they scrutinize every piece of art you produce, you, they scrutinize every film that you produce. Where are you going to have a civilization? You don't have. It is curdled under repression, hence repression. It is, I don't think you can have a vibrant civilization. Now, the exception is Iran. That's why I thought you were asking me about Iran. Iran is a mystery. You, you could talk to the audience about Iran separately. Iran is not the tyranny of the kind these others are. It is a very complex entity where you have a combination of a commitment to broad Islam, the revolution, the revolution, and you find certain constraints. And yet you find the most outstanding literature today in that region is from Iran. Best cinema is from Iran. Art from Iran. So I think I need, I don't know enough 
on this subject to dilate on this more. I think that something one needs to reflect on. In what environments do you get artistic expression that becomes of global value? I think we need to compare. Say Saudi Arabia has produced nothing in the last 200 years. Nothing, absolutely. Oman lurches towards some kind of accommodativeness. You had a Booker Prize winner. But I want to add one point. Because of absence of translation, we are discussing translation a lot in our country these days. Arab women writers are very, very articulate in Saudi Arabia, both as short story writers and as novelists. But we are not familiar with their literature. I have read some extracts, they are very, very powerful. And their writings are very hostile, they're very angry about their religion, about the life daily. They don't talk about absence of freedom and tyranny of MBS and others, about the tyranny they suffer in a patriarchal order. So that is very much it. About Western authors, you are right. Much of the writing that you find on West Asia is from Western sources because I am comfortable with the language. I, I have tried my best to get uh, Arab writers and many of them whom I have found are actually in Western universities. Most of those who write in West Asia, they write under controlled conditions. You can't have the best foreign policy discourse of the kind you and I would like and which I would be able to quote. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. I mean, what are, you, what are you going to get? You get the official line on almost everything and that official line changes because of something. So yes, you are absolutely right. At the same time, I would say that my book is a non-Western perception very robustly, actively, harshly non-Western. And I'm a very harsh critic of Western, what they have done up to now. So to that extent, the perception is non-Western. Even if I have quoted from Western sources, the other thing I have done is whenever I have discussed Israel, I quote Israeli sources. Otherwise, they will easily rubbish my work and say, hey. JCPOA, I think JCPOA is, we don't know which way it will go, you get a city signal from the Americans that they want to conclude it. You get a signal from the Iranians, they want to conclude it. There's a lot of war of, of misinformation also going on. I'm not sure which way things will go. I get the sense that on both sides, there is very strong desire to conclude it. Uh, and the other day, I read an article from, uh, from Israel, which has been opposing the revival of the JCPOA saying that Israeli leaders are today satisfied that it will be approved. It will be approved because you would rather restrain Iran's nuclear program rather than give them the freedom and then have to bomb them later on and create a regional conflict. So on balance, 60-40, my own sense is there will be an agreement. Now, what you are reading in the media is very very tortured. I think it's very difficult to know who is saying what and why. Both sides, there's a war of information, which is not the real thing. Uh, so I really don't know. Because there's a lot of, you are posturing for domestic constituencies. Biden looks, I dare I add the word, pathetic. So he has to look good. He's facing an election in a few months. He loses that election, he becomes lame duck in two years. So he has to look macho. And he's got this right-wing constituency who are going to abuse him if any agreement he does. And if he's shown to be conceding something to the Iranian, they're going to rip him apart and beat him at the election. So they want the Iranians to show that we accommodated because you get Biden rather than prepare the ground for Donald Trump or his clone. This is the game that is going on there. In Iran also you have a similar problem. You have the IRGC, which is very, very upset with the killing of Qasem Soleimani and now this colonel who was assassinated. Israel has the right to kill. As I keep on telling you, James Bond could kill one at a time. The Israelis can kill several people at a time. License to kill with impunity. They have that. Americans also have it and Israelis have it. So this is where we are. They are upset. They say that, you know, we should not concede anything. Foreign office says we should concede. Let's get the agreement. Let's get some sanctions. We know in two years' time there is going to be the Republicans again in the White House and this agreement is going to be closed. For two years, let's get something going, get some of the money in, 
try to ameliorate the economic conditions at home and we'll see after two years what happens. So you have a lot of intense debates going on at home today in a very fraught environment. Thank you. We have run out of time. Thank you for your patience. And uh, let's end with a round of applause for... Thank you all. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of Pune International Center, I would like to extend a hearty vote of thanks to our chairperson this evening, Ambassador Gautam Bambavle, and a hearty vote of thanks to our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Kalvini Zaber. Thank you, Professor Alwight, for sharing your thoughts. This was truly an engaging discussion. Thank you to Team PIC and to our lovely audience for making this event a success. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.